folks, and welcome to this episode of Michael's Backyard Marina. This is the one that I put out the $50 bounty on, troubleshooting the problem. Uh, I've gotten a lot of great responses. I told you when I brought out part two of the episodes for this thing that I would uh, draw a name. Well, I want to call this part 1.5 because right now, as you can see, this handle is really loose. And that's one of the things I want to address and see if we can discover in this video what's causing it. I had a lot of good suggestions that was what was causing this handle issue, but we're actually the, the bounties on the running issue. And a lot of you have some great comments. I've had some great feedback. You guys have been incredibly awesome audience. have been an incredibly awesome audience. And uh, been so proud to see what my, my uh, subscribers and the, and the people that watch my channel have been able to put forth for me. Uh, so kudos to you guys for your great comments and great suggestions. What I'm going to do today in this video is we're going to have to, in order to get to this loose handle situation and address it, because there is some uh, comments in there about a plugged exhaust port. So we'll be able to do, we'll be able to discover what that is when we pull the power head off. And you also have to pull the power head off to get to these two bolts that are down inside. So in this video, that's what we're going to cover is we're going to pull the pull a bunch of things apart. Uh, we'll do some examinations of some of the stuff as I pull it off to see uh, if we can see anything obvious. I've got a lit magnifying glass that we're going to look at the carburetor bowl in because there's been some suggestions about a cracked carburetor bowl. There's been suggestions of a bad reed valve. Uh, there's been a uh, plugged exhaust system due to the, the plate that holds this in place falling down inside and clogging it up. There has been power pack uh, suggestions timing suggestions, uh, compression suggestions, overheating situation, all kinds of different, overheating with coils getting hot and not firing, power packs getting hot and not working properly, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So you guys have just thrown a ton of suggestions out there for me to look at, and I'm gonna try to systematically go through these one by one and uh, to figure out what's going on with this bad boy. Because I really like the old, old motor, and it's, uh, it's in really great shape for its age. Uh, like I said, it's an 80. I think this is an 89. I'm trying to remember now. I'm trying to remember. I think it's. I think this was the 89. Anyway, you'll see it. It's in the description anyway. So we'll end up pulling this cover off today, and we're gonna pull the starter off. We're gonna pull the carburetor off, and I'm gonna go through that with you in as much detail as I can, uh, and we'll. Uh, We'll get this power head lifted off of here and discover what the heck is going on with this bad boy. And we'll go from there. So you guys stay with me. Like I said, this is part 1.5. This isn't the drawing yet. Uh, I've got to discover what the issue is, fix it and have it running before I can actually go definitively, this is what went wrong. This is what we're gonna do to fix it. And, or this is what we did to fix it. And here's how it's running in my test tank. Because I have a feeling by the time I get this running, it's gonna be way too cold to go out in the water. It's it's been dropping down in the 30s or below freezing, you know, below 32 and below freezing overnight. So the time out on the lakes are over, but I have this awesome indoor test tank so I can actually test this thing and run it for as long as I want inside and see if the problem is truly fixed under load and everything else in between. Because right now it doesn't run. You saw what it did, it just blah, 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 and dies. Uh, but we're gonna to continue to march forward with this thing and see if we can bring her back once again. It never really was dead, dead before, but it's definitely got some underlying issues that we need to address here. And um, from some, there again, from some of the comments I've been getting, uh, these things have had some bushing issues and stuff that go on that swell and don't work right uh, after a bit of time and they'll actually clog and, and prevent stuff from working properly, so. Let's get into it and let's start taking this thing apart. And I'm gonna make some mistakes pulling it apart. I'll guarantee it. You guys are gonna be there right there with me. So if you happen to do the same thing, you don't have to make, same, make the same mistakes I did. But uh, we'll go cautiously and carefully. And I'll try not to make as many mistakes as other. I like to make fewer mistakes. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a fan of making giant mistakes. So let's jump in. Now one of the first thing I've done is I've taken the power the pull cord rope, and I tied a little slip knot in the end here and I hung it on here. So it's still got all the spring tension under everything, but it can't just go crazy and unwind on me right now. At least I hope not. 
Then we're gonna take our 9 16 wrench and we'll back this bolt all the way off and we'll lift the recoil starter out and get it out of the way so I can remove the carburetor next. Now that I've done a couple of these, these aren't so awful to do. And you definitely, it's easier to pull this out to get at the carburetor. Some people will say, oh, you can get it. You can get that out, the carburetor out without removing that. Eh, I did it once and it took me a long time to get that all accomplished. It was a painful process. So once I get that bolt out, we'll slip that out. Now, the other thing I'm gonna do here is I got me a little clamp little vice grip clamp here. Let's see if I make sure I got you in the picture here. And I'll just open this up so it'll just kind of bear hug all this real comfortably. And I'm not going to put a lot of pressure on this, folks. This is just to hold it. Oh, that's a little too much. This is hold it so my spring don't get away from me. So right there. And I'm going to lay it in a pan just like that until I'm ready to put it back on. The next thing we're gonna go after is the carburetor. And the carburetor is relatively easy from this point. Once you got that out of the way, there's just a, a bolt or nut on a stud on each side. It's two seven sixteenths. We'll remove the gas line off of it. And then these two bolts and the cart, and we'll pull the uh, choke lever or the lean mixture, the mixture uh, thing out, knob. I've already pulled the air silencer off of it. That's just two bolts that were on top that had con contained the choke lever. So didn't see any reason to show that to you. That's pretty self-explanatory. So let's get these two nuts off. Now I'm gonna do a little quick walk around with you here. Right now there's, there's one motor mount bolt here, it looks like. I'll be taking that one loose. And there's another one right down behind this fuel line hose here. We'll take that guy loose. And there's one clear back here at the back of the, by the heads. There's one there. That looks like all of the upper ones. So there's like one, two, three. Looks like there's three on the upper part here. And then, then we'll go after the bottom ones here. As you can see underneath here, there's one, two, three on one side and there's three on the other side. And I think once I've got all those loose, I can lift this power head right off of here. Uh, I will have to disconnect the wiring for the kill switch here. And I think that's all the wiring I will have to disconnect. I think the rest of it can come off together. I don't see why it can't. The whole wiring harness and everything should lift off with it then. We're gonna try that. I'll let you know if it doesn't work. We're gonna go into time-lapse mode here because there's no sense in watching you, watch, you guys watching me back off a bunch of bolts. I told you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do it. And if there's anything different, I'll tell you what's different. All right, I'm gonna catch you up on the progress here. We have, I have, not we have, I have, removed this fuel line. I actually went ahead and decided it was gonna be best, let me walk you around here, to remove all the wiring. I'm not so sure you had to, but I thought, well, instead of possibly damaging my power pack or damaging the coils uh, or any other wiring, and plus I could see exactly what I was doing here, I was able to, you know, clear out a lot of this mass. I don't want it to have it on there anyway when I'm pulling this out and looking at things. So it was just best off I took it out of the way. The other thing I did is around under here, you can pull this gasket down and you can get a putty knife right through here. And you can take a putty knife and drive in between the power head and the lower head through, through that gasket to separate that gasket. You don't want to you don't want to be out here 
prying on any of this stuff trying to pop it loose you'll break something guarantee it so let's uh let's not do that so what i did is i pried that loose and then once i got it broke broke loose a little bit with a uh a nice steel putty knife i got a screwdriver in there and kind of lift it a little bit and as you can see now the whole motor head is loose now the one thing I got left to do is the shift linkage is still connected. I gotta break that loose. I think I can lift the whole power head out. None of these bolts I removed are crazy tight. There we go. Whoops, I dropped a washer, dropped a bunch of stuff there. We'll retrieve that in a minute. Actually, I can stick that bolt right back in there as a reminder of where it goes. And when I fish that washer back out, I'll stick it back on there. Now let's see how close are we to picking everything up here. It looks like we can. Oh, P2 was hanging up there. Oh, I see that hanging up. Got some of the wiring here. There we go. And voila, it's free. Now, quite frankly, while you're this deep into it, we're going to take this pan completely off. I think I have to. I may have to anyway, but we'll know more. But I want to clean it up, do a good job. So when we put this thing back together, she is uh, fresh and clean through and through. No sense in putting it back together with it being a, a total mess. And I got some new degreaser I want to try. And we'll see how well it works. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this cotter pin out of the shift linkage. That's what currently, that's one of the pieces that's keeping me from pulling this pan completely off. I'm trying to get it a little ear straightened out so I can get that pulled off. I've got a little, got a little tray over here. I'm putting all these little parts in so I can, uh, there we go. I keep them all together. So now that'll let the shift linkage be free. Now the other thing I want to do is this cable mount over on this other side here where your throttle cable comes through. I think that's the only thing I got left to remove. That's got a little tiny thing on it. It's like a little 5 16th socket takes care of this guy. And that's like a little ball thing here that should pull through the cover now hopefully maybe with this little bit of wiring the only wires that are actually coming out of here that let's see what do we got here this should be the kill switch wires so these two wires actually went to the kill switch and went to a went through the kill switch and a ground this other wire that's coming out of here just went to a ground. And that's probably why this kill switch quit working. I think there's supposed to be another wire in here, possibly. But I know it's not working. I'll probably get that working again, too. Let's see, will all this fit through that little rubber grommet now? Yeah, see, there's another wire in there. That should have been the kill switch wire. It's got two kill switch wires. It's got one button and it's got one safety kill. See if I can sneak this stuff out of here. There you go. Pan comes right off. Now's a great time to replace this gasket that's here. We'll put a new one on most likely. Now I can see my loose handle problem is probably this guy right there. It would appear. Because these rubber bushings look pretty good in here. Don't look like anything's wrong with them. Let's just see the how tight these bolts are. No doubt they're loose. About a turn, turn and a half each. As you can see, this handle's still loose, but look at that right there. I have a feeling that is a little tiny screw there. Looks like maybe one three eight socket here. Voila, it's tight. 
but you ain't getting to that without pulling all that off. What I'll do is I'll end up pulling these bolts back out, clean them up, and I'll put some blue Loctite on them. <coughs> nice thing about blue Loctite, it will hold the bolt in place. But now look at that handle. It's as solid as can be. And all it was is that little joker there. I'm gonna back it the rest of the way out and take a look at it. It's amazing. Cause it could have gone a long time with these bolts being the way they were. This was, this was the uh, leverage point, so to speak, that fastens it down nice and solid. Well, there we go. That, that little joker right there. Look, I'll clean it up. I'll degrease down in here and degrease the bolt and the threads real good with some brake cleaner or something like that. Something that dries grease free and oil free. And I'll coat that coat that bolt in blue Loctite, but yeah, look at that. That's as tight as can be now. <laughs> now somebody mentioned they thought maybe this might have fallen off while this was loose had fallen off and went down in there and plugged up the exhaust. That's not the case, null and void. Uh, so yeah, the loose handle is bolt only right there and about a turn on each one of these bolts. That's it. Everything else looks pretty good. So we'll get this gasket scraped here. As you can see, I pulled this down out of the way so I could get my putty knife. Let me show you where that putty knife went in at on the power head. So it's right under here and I got a nice thin blade putty knife. And I put it right there and I gave it a couple cracks on the end with the hammer and it popped that gasket loose. And once I got it worked up a little bit, I just got a regular screwdriver in here underneath there and wiggled it and did one of these numbers and it just loosened up the whole gasket surface. And that's how we got that off with no damage. Now this gasket could be reused easily enough. I didn't do, I might've cracked it a little bit here, but honestly, you could put that back on and it would work just fine. But I'll see how much they are. It's like, I'm in this far. I don't mind spending four, five, 10, 15 bucks here and there just to make things absolutely right. Versus like, eh, we can get by. Now, one thing I wanna show you here is there is a ground wire that is going from this piece here and bolts underneath this motor mount. You'll wanna put that back, make sure that's back in place uh, before you, uh, when you put that motor mount bolt back in. So there it is, folks. That's how easy it is to take that power head off. Relatively short amount of time to do that. And uh, we've discovered the one mystery was the wiggly handle. So we got that taken care of. And the other thing I want to show you, and I can get you right down in here, I think, is so far, we'll answer a couple more questions here that might people had suspicions of. You get a bright flashlight. See if you can see right down in there. I can see clear down. There's the exhaust is not plugged in any way. So that's on this part anyway, it's not plugged. We'll look at the power head and we'll look at the condition of that exhaust port and see if that's plugged. And that'll be another one that people suggested why I didn't see any exhaust bubbles uh, was due to it being plugged. So far, I'm not seeing the culprit. Now, as you can see here, I took everything out. I got these nice little stainless trays. I put all the parts in the stainless tray for this motor so they don't get lost, mixed up with anything else. We'll set this aside. And we got the pan here that will clean up, get all the uh, excess anything off of. I'll go ahead and pull this fuel hose off. This is a new fuel line I'm pretty sure I put on here. Uh, I believe, pretty sure it was. Um, but yeah, we'll get all this cleaned up. There's still a, a few more washers here. We need to pull off the, for the motor mount. I'll make sure I stick those back on. I'm not gonna lie to you. I actually sometimes go back and review my video. When it comes time to put some stuff back together, I'll watch it back. Just a reminder, cause it might be a week or two between messing with this stuff. And it's real easy to forget what you did or didn't do. So yeah, that's the pan. I can leave this connected. This is your shift 
lockout basically for so it won't run go into gear when you're trying to start it that's what and i shouldn't say that's not that's forward and reverse but it's it has some other useful purposes in there i'm not getting it right you guys can correct me in there in the comments if you want uh i'll have to i'll probably speak more to it when i put it back together but what it does is this goes and interferes with the throttle plate so you can't be a wide open throttle you can be at the start position when this is in a certain position and forward and reverse then you can go to wide open throttle and even in reverse it has a limit and forward then it lets you go wide open so all right we'll go ahead and resolve another question somebody thought that maybe the exhaust tube here was plugged i shined the light up in there it's clear i can see clear up in there no problem there's no obstructions in there whatsoever but i am going to go ahead and order me some rubber grommets i probably go ahead and take this off and uh we'll take a look up in there real quick just to just to show you what's going on and you know me i just like taking things apart period anyway so let's just go ahead and pull that exhaust manifold off the cool part about this exhaust manifold now there's some there's a lot of questions a lot of comments about you know what makes the difference between a 9.9 and a 15 horse and blah 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 and this it has a lot to do with the years um i've actually currently got one uh, an outboard back in the 70s and i'm converting from a 9.9 to a 15 horse properly due to the year that it's in uh, i have another power head over here let me drag it over and i'll show you the difference between some of the older styles and newer styles when it comes to the exhaust and what it looks like okay here's what i'm talking about this is a 70s version exhaust pipe here's an 80s version exhaust pipe now from 74 to 78, they had this type of pipe on it. And even past 78 and 79, they had this pipe on it. And I'm not exactly sure of the year when they went to the tuned exhaust. They called this a tuned exhaust. And they did that for more performance. Uh, but in the 74 to 78 years, the only difference, and you guys could argue with me all you want, but you will be absolutely wrong because I've researched it, studied, and looked at parts diagrams. From 74 to 78, the only difference between a 15 horse and a 9.9 .9 was the carburetor. It's a bigger throat carburetor. That's the only difference. And I'm gonna show you right here about the exact difference that it would be. Now this is a newer carburetor, obviously, but this is an old 9.9 .9 carburetor. This is a newer 15 horse carburetor. See the difference in the through, the through hole in the bore. That's the major difference, 74 to 78. Now, you guys are going to leave comments. You're going to tell me I'm full of BS and I'm wrong. But if you're listening to my words and not reacting, you'll know that I'm right. 74 to 78. Carburetor only. Change in diameter, change in jets, obviously, to let more fuel in. But it's a bigger bore, more airflow. In 79... They still had this exhaust pipe. And then the only difference on the reed plate, the restrictor plates and the reeds, let me see if I can find that for you. On the 99s, nine I've got a newer one here somewhere. Let me find it. I don't have it in front of me here. Uh, anyway, in between 78 and 79, the only difference between a 99 and a 15 horse, same exhaust, but under here, there's a spacer underneath the restrictor plate here. These reed valves bounce open up. These keep the reed valves from opening up too far and breaking off and whatnot and flexing too far and wearing them out prematurely. Uh, there's a, I forget what it is. I want to say it's like a 12 thousandths or 12 and a half thousandths maybe spacer underneath this restrictor plate. So 78, no spacer. 79 had a spacer under here. But the reed valves were exactly the same, exact same part number. You go look it up in the fish diagrams, and these part numbers are all exactly the same, except this one has a, the 79s have a spacer. Now, what I don't know is what exactly what year they went from the square to the tuned exhaust. I don't, I'm not sure of that. But you mark my words, those are the main differences in this specific 74 to 78. I know I'm repeating it. I want you guys to hear it, and I want the doubters to listen. Um, that was the major difference between a 9.9 and a 15 horse is they basically detuned the carburetor so it didn't make as good an air pump and the RPMs were like a 
On the 74 to 78 9.9s, the RPM range was 4,500 to 5,500 RPMs. And when they put the bigger carburetor on it, uh, it ran harder, obviously. And the RPM range was a 50, uh, what was it? Yeah, 5,500 to 6,500. Took the RPM range up another 1,000. And that's how they got their 15 horses out of it, is they got more RPMs, just made a better air compressor out of it. Anyway, that's a lot of knowledge there for you guys. And those real and factual and cannot be refuted. If you want to refute it, I would suggest you go to a website called Leroy's Ramblings. And just do a Google search on Leroy's Ramblings. You will find everything you wanted to know and more about 9.9s, 15s, and a lot, of, a lot of other outboard stuff. The guy had documented a ton of stuff, and he was very specific on years and when things happened, and it was... And that's where I got some of my information from. Also, I dug in myself to go look at the parts diagrams and this exact same part numbers were called out. So anyway, I just wanted to clear the air on that. Uh, I know there's been a lot of controversy about that uh, and a lot of communication about that on my channel. And this is where I go and shut it down a little bit. And I also have a 1978 9.9 .9 that I'm putting a 15 horse carburetor on and I'm gonna show you the performance difference. So it will truly be a 15 horse uh, just by changing the carburetor. But with that being said, we know this exhaust is good and not plugged so far. I'm going to go ahead and pull it off because these rubber grommets around here I want to replace. It's one of those things, where do you stop? Well, I stop when it's right. That's all there is to it. Boy, I tell you what, there is nothing on this so far that has been like gonna break the bolt off tight. It's all been just barely tight. I mean, it's just snug and not, I'd call it just past finger tight almost. So we're gonna go ahead and pull this exhaust pipe off. And we'll just clear up any, any confusion that that the exhaust pipe might have been why the bubbles weren't coming out. It could have been just that it wasn't firing enough, period. But yeah, I'm going to get that intake plate off. We're going to inspect those reed valves. There's been a lot of communication about those reed valves. We're going to get into that today. Um, like I said, this is going to be a discovery video. And I think we're going to try to pump a little gas into that carburetor, see if we can see a crack in the bowl, see where it might be leaking out at. Um, One more here. That should pop right off of there, huh? Yeah, there we go. Not much going on there. I can see the piston right there moving. There's no plugage or blockage there. But uh, now that that's out of the way, that's going to make it a lot easier to, to uh, get that uh, gasket cleaned up. The other good thing now is I think I can set this thing up on a block maybe. Because I'm gonna pull this cover off next. Matter of fact, I don't think I need to. Uh, this is being put under any undue stress. I don't believe. Eh, maybe it is. Let me see if I can get a block to set this up on and we'll work on it from there. All right, let's go ahead and buzz off. You can see these bolts have never been touched before. All the paint's still on them. like all the bolts are the same length so far in this model. Nope, there's a shorty. 
there's the normal ones. There's only one short one up in this right hand corner here. And looks like she's there. Let's just give it a little love tap here. There we go. We got our reed plate exposed. Everything in here looks just sparkling clean, boys. I ain't telling you. And girls, I know I got some I got some female watches out there too. I appreciate it. All right. Let's go ahead and carefully remove this gasket. Well, we won't we won't re be reusing any gaskets, I'll tell you that. I don't roll that way. I put all new on wherever possible. Unless it's an obsolete thing. So we got that off. And this reed plate should just be uh looks like a little another thin gasket on the other side of this reed plate. We'll just take the little putty knife again. Get between that reed plate and the gasket and just give it a little tap. Oh yeah. She's coming off easy. There we go. Don't want to stress anything there. But uh Everything looks golden delicious in there. We're looking at the reed plate here and uh, reed valves. They seem to be in really good shape. I don't see anything jumping out at me here. Now looking at the gaskets on both sides of the reed plate, they all looked like they were sealed off pretty good. Um, I see a nice impression all the way around. Of how this bad boy is mounted up. Blip, 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 right there. There's nothing obvious that's saying it's not sealing around each one of these openings here. That looks pretty tight. Um, the only gap I have right here, it looks like it's a, a on purpose gap because that's a gap, uh, dent in the gas or casting there. So that's normal. There's nothing there that says this was uh, leaking past the gasket. That's the inner gasket here, the outer gasket. Has a nice solid compression. You know the bolts weren't. Now these bolts, I use the impact to back off. I probably should just. But you know they were they were snug enough. There was nothing there that uh, made me doubt what's going on here. Let's go ahead and pull these reeds off. I really like this stainless top for doing surgical like work. Let's get down on this a little bit. The only thing I've noticed on the reed so far. Is that one reed? I don't know if I can get it to show you. Let's see if I can get it to show up on camera at all. Uh, yeah, you can see right there. So I take the light away, but you can see the daylight peeking out from underneath that one right there. But I mean, it's not like it's bent crazy open, but it's open a little bit. Could that be the culprit? Could that cause some back pressure? I mean, it wouldn't take much much action from the piston to just push that shut. I mean, that's it's not like it's bent open. So, I'm not calling that a failure point. Now, I would appreciate you guys' comments. If you've seen something like that and that was the failure point, I'd appreciate to hear the feedback on that, but it, just doesn't seem like there's enough there um, that I could call it a failure point. Hmm. Now there was some sticky stuff on the back of here and I'm gonna pull that off. And we're gonna take a little deeper dive behind. Just take a closer look with this off. 
Now I do understand there's some Boyson reeds out there. And the cool part about Boyson reeds is they actually, that the uh, this is actually like a carbon fiber and the reed is a, a carbon fiber and they are supposed to be better performance. Here's that one spacer I was telling you about that's on the 15 horse models that are not on the 99s on the older years. See if I can get that to pop out of there. Yeah, that's. I'm gonna put this back together exactly the way it came apart. But you can see there, these are in reasonably clean, reasonably good shape. Nothing alarming there. That was, you know, that's telling me to holy smokes, that's the smoking gun. Now there's some buildup on the back here. Nothing that little wire wheel action wouldn't just knock right off. So I'm gonna do that. I cleaned up the back sides. And, you know, I took them all the way off and looked at the seat that these are going against. And well, I tell you what, that thing is just, uh, it's clean. This thing looks like brand new. Uh, but what I am gonna do, cause this does have time and age on it. I don't know how many miles it has on it, but for the cost of a set of reed valves, I'm gonna put new reed valves on it. But I honestly, unless you guys can tell me that little bit, that one being lifted up a little bit could be my smoking gun. I'm just telling you, it wouldn't take much pressure coming from that piston just to just to slam that shut. But it could it could allow a little bit of blowback before it slams shut. But I don't think that's why it died. I don't think that's my smoking gun. But that's why this is part 1.5 instead of part two, because um, I wasn't quite ready to do a part two without getting some more feedback from you guys out there in uh, YouTube land. Because I think. Uh, so far, I want you to see everything I'm seeing. And so far, what I'm seeing, there's nothing that says this wouldn't run and run okay. You know, at least fire up and run, especially once it's under pressure. These things are flapping back and forth like a, a bumblebee's wings. And uh, I could see if it was if it was standing open like that, I could say, yeah, that's probably a big deal. But that's just so close to being closed, but it's only one. Anyway, I think I'm going to go, I'll order new gaskets and reeds for this. We'll put that in. But I don't, like I said, that's not my smoking gun just yet. That's not the reason it won't start and run. Like I said, this thing, when it was out on the water, it was running hard. And then just slowly went, died. And at first I thought it was that gasket issue. But uh, so far, that gasket issue on the carburetor didn't stop the gas flow so we're going to look at that carburetor next all right i got my magnifier out here guys that's why the lens looks a little round right now because we're looking through that uh my magnifier little dealy bop here but sure enough look what i found right here i think this is our smoking gun got your carburetor cracked right down around here so it would just sit there and blow out fuel leak it out wouldn't quite fill the bowl all the way up but yeah she's cracked right around that screw so right now i'm calling that the smoking gun why it wouldn't run and why there's fuel dumping everywhere because it won't fill up and it won't do what it's supposed to do and you got carburetor problems stuff just don't run and then a few of you out there said that uh these old carburetors are notorious for cracking and lo and behold, that's our carburetor bowl. And I think a few of you even said that this uh, top plate possibly cracks too. That that could cause you some issues. And I'm looking at this underneath the magnifier as well, just to see if I can see anything that uh, looks suspect on the top plate. And so far, I don't see anything up. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, something I don't like what I'm seeing. That could be a culprit, too. I'm going to call that smoking gun number two. Let me see if I can get this around here for you. That's hard for you to see. But because this is plastic and because of heat and everything else, there's a gap right here. 
I don't know if you guys can see that. There's a little gap that developed right around there. I'm going to pull this back off just to see if I can see if that lifted area there would cause a, a, a leakage through here. My suspicions are that it would. Yeah, I can see there's like some raised areas around here that are designed to bite into the gasket and seal things off a little bit. And I can see where that corner being lifted up would cause a monster issue with it starting to leak and not do what it's supposed to do through these channels here. So I think that's my smoking gun number two is that warp plate. It's not cracked that I can see anywhere. Under magnification looks pretty, pretty solid. So been nice if they had to put like one more screw over here to kind of hold things flat, but they did not design it that way. They did not design it that way at all. So yeah, we'll call that a problem for sure. Let's go ahead and pull this bowl off. A few of you did comment about there being a, me putting that uh, float in there instead of the cork float. Um, that's, I've had plenty of the plastic floats in these before and haven't had an issue with them. So I'm going to discount that as being the issue. But now that all of you have seen this video so far, uh, as of today or as of when this video gets posted, all new comments past this time frame will not be accepted into the uh, what could have went wrong situation. But yeah, and we'll also check when I put this back together. We'll also check to make sure that this uh, the float does shut off this current float because some of you commented about the needle seat and down here. So I will confirm that that is currently shutting off with the with the what's existing there. I have no reason to change that. But uh, the old crack a smack a thing right here. Where'd it go? Yeah, I can follow that crack. It's hard to see without the magnification and the light. Um, And that crack floats, that crack comes right around through here. So by not letting it build up and fill up and, and float this float as full as it should to shut off the gas, it would let the gas stay open and it would just flood itself out. And that's why when it died on the lake, I could see gas running down. I'll show you here, our fuel. Um, was running through the pan and spilling all down. You can see how nasty all this looks. It was just fuel running all down through here. So it was coming out of the pan and just draining like a son of a gun down through there. Yeah, and there's a spot in the pan where it could have just pooled up here, ran right down in there and just spilled right down the neck and drained all over. So right now, unless I'm convinced otherwise, cracked fuel bowl and warped uh combination of the fuel bowl and warp top plate but i'm thinking this is smoking gun one and this is smoking gun number two this is a 45 this is a 22 short that's how much of a smoking gun i'm putting weight on it here i'll be entertaining you guys comments when this video is posted to go yeah i was right blah 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 or yeah you were right or whatever you want to say or if i should look at something else i will definitely look into something else but so far, everything I've seen here is pointing at this and not necessarily the ignition yet. I will be ohming out, before I put this thing all back together, I'll be ohming out the uh, coils and making sure they have the right resistance so that uh, some of you have made a comment about the spark jumping. Well, the one thing nice about these things is when they got a strong spark, if you don't have a spark plug in there, don't have it grounded, it will seek spark out wherever it can seek it out. And I've seen them jump clear around a coil and jump to the surface, and it's just amazing. And I, some of you guys caught that in the other video, uh, how that spark was sparking out like that. But, uh, alrighty. 
I think I'm gonna call this one done for now. I gotta order parts and put this bad boy back together. Well, folks, we learned a lot of stuff today. Uh, learned why my handle was loose. I think we learned why the, the engine shut down uh, prematurely while I was out on the lake. Uh, cracked bowl there, obviously. And uh, that was interesting. I hope you guys found this informative. I hope you're not scared to dig into your little motor here like this. This little 15 horse are overall pretty simple to work on. It's just nuts and bolts and wiring. Uh, be careful with what you're doing. Kind of get an idea of what you're looking for. I'm hoping these videos are helping you guys uh, out there see what you're looking for and somewhere to kind of help you troubleshoot. I am stoked that it was a carburetor bowl, but I'm also not stoked because of the design, just that little bit of wiggle in the handle was caused by one bolt. One bolt caused all that wiggle. And the fact that it's not Loctited down. Now maybe they use something that, because of the materials, it's a stainless bolt I'm guessing, uh, it maybe would seize at some point in time in history or the life of it and cause it to lock, you know, self Loctite. Uh, that's not the case with this one. So we're gonna, we're gonna clean everything up. We're gonna we put some blue Loctite. Red Loctite is fine if you want something to never come apart unless you put heat to it. Uh, the, I, and I say Loctite, there's Permatex, there's all different brands of, of, uh, of uh, it's kind of like Loctite. People say Loctite, it's Thread Locker. Let's just call it Thread Locker. Uh, thread Locker, there's different grades of it. There's like the blue, which is a, it holds pretty well, or holds things from moving, and is workable, what they call a workable Loctite. You don't have to add heat. When you start dealing with the, the thread lockers that are like the red series and different ones, uh, you have to put like 400 degrees into it before it actually breaks loose. And there's, and there's applications for that. This application, not so much. Uh, I could put red in there because the goal of this is that never has to come apart again. You see, that's, the, that's not something you normally service. The good news is the rubber bushings that are there look like they're in great shape. So once I clean up the bolts and tighten them back down, everything's gonna work like it should. All the rubber mounting on this thing, it looks like it's in terrific shape. No sense in, no need to replace that. But uh, anyway, we're gonna get some parts ordered. It's kinda gonna be another week or two before I'm back on this, just because, or maybe three or four, because parts are, are not shipping as fast as they used to. There seems to be during this pandemic, there's a lot of demand on recreational stuff. People are doing more recreational, recreationally than they have been in the past. And the supply chain has also been severely disrupted because not everything's flowing through the supply chain from where all these parts are purchased um, and manufactured to the uh, warehouses to be distributed out to us, the consumer. But uh, I hope you guys had fun today. I had some fun today. Uh, learned a lot, learned more than I did before. Uh, and I hope I taught you guys some stuff. Uh, every time I dig into one of these motors, some of it's routine, some of it's like, ooh, didn't see that coming, didn't see that happening. But I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Coming up will be part two of this series, and they'll be in the, um, uh, there's like a, I got part one out there right now. I name them the same thing, except there's a part one. This is gonna be a part 1.5, and then there's gonna be a part two. And part two is where I'm gonna give away the $50 gift card uh, for the people that got the solution to the issue correct. And uh, we'll be announcing that on the part two video. Uh, I've been excited about this. You guys have done a great job out there. I've got some great subscribers. I got some great people that love the, that have been enjoying watching the videos. And I give me that thumbs up. Uh, and that really helps me out a lot. I appreciate your viewership folks. And uh, until part two comes out, and then there'll be some videos between part 1.5 and part two, just for the simple fact, I've got to have several, I mean, honestly, I've got to have several motors going at the same time as far as processes, because I've got to work on them, show you the video, order parts, get the parts in, uh, and try to give you guys some good content in between. So with that being said, you guys get out there and have yourself some fun. Enjoy the weather as it happens when you got good weather. When you don't have good weather, hunker down inside and enjoy something indoors. This is Michael, and I'm out.